So the title of my talk today is The Historical Origins of Scientific Racism, but to uh, just to sort of orient us and uh, make it all very real for us, I just want to start with um, something that's very familiar, you know, very familiar for many of us who've been coming to the NYU campus for the last uh, few months, and that is uh, through the submission through the uh, Binks company of our uh, tests for COVID. And, uh, you know, many of us have been doing this every couple of weeks. We have to go through the process on the website to successfully activate your box. And in order to successfully activate your box, you have to answer the following questions. Which of the following best describes your ethnic group, Hispanic or Latino, not Hispanic or Latino or other? And which of the following best describes your race? Please select all that apply. And so we have to make a, uh, a decision here about you know, which race do we uh, self-identify with on you know, a regular basis. And this in fact is consistent in this sort of biomedical setting with the NIH policy and guidelines on the inclusion of women and minorities as subjects in clinical uh, research. So the NIH classifies a minority group as a readily identifiable subset of the US population that's distinguished by racial, ethnic, and or cultural heritage. And they state that principal investigators should assess the theoretical and or scientific linkages between sex, gender, race, ethnicity, and their topic of uh, study. The NIH defines for us what the ethnic categories are, they define uh, ethnic categories as being either Hispanic or Latino, uh, which is a person of Cuban, Mexican, Puerto Rican, South or Central American or other Spanish cultural origins, regardless of race or not Hispanic or Latino. And they define the following uh, racial categories for minority racial categories as uh, individuals belonging to either American Indian or native Alas uh, Alaskan natives, Asians, black or African American, or native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. And these definitions are, or these categories are all uh, defined as a person having origins in any of the original peoples of a particular uh, part of the world. It's interesting within this uh, definition that the NIH provides for us that in fact, we see the fluidity and arbitrary uh, nature of racial definitions the Asian category includes people of the Philippine Islands, but the NIH states that individuals from the Philippine Islands have been recorded as Pacific Islanders in previous data collection uh, strategies. So the question for us then is what, what is race? And in fact, if you look at uh, consensus thinking in, uh, in the academy, as uh, reported by the American Association of Physical Anthropologists, the American Anthropological Association or the American Sociological Association or the American Society of Human Genetics in consensus statements that have been made by these uh, academic groups. These are summarized in Angela Saini's uh, excellent recent book, Superior, The Return of Race Science, in which she states that race has been accepted by academics as a social reality, not a biological one. Race affects how we live, but not who we are genetically. And this is indeed the consensus thinking amongst uh, scientists today. But what I wanna do in this lecture, and uh, as Monroe pointed out, we need to look at our history is I wanna to convey to you that this concept of race originated as a scientific concept. It came about in the 18th century and uh, was introduced as a typological classification and I want to take you through the history of uh, race as a scientific concept and its use in the 19th century for the justification of Euro European superiority. And then the history throughout the 20th century in which at the beginning of the century it was used as the rationale for discrimination and oppression as manifest through the eugenics movement. It's culminated in the mid 20th century as providing a scientific justification for the Holocaust but that we see in the late 20th century that there's been a refutation of the scientific basis of, uh, of race. But then I wanna take you into the 21st century to discuss some of the ways in which race and ancestry remain uh, included in biomedical studies. And I'm going to give you just some examples of how science remain, can still be appropriated 
uh, for racist agendas and for the perpetuation of stereotypes and touch on a couple of the current issues in the incorporation of genetic ancestry and biomedical studies. And what I hope to do is get us to the point where we can have a uh, discussion of some of the prompts that I've provided with you or any other questions that you come up throughout, uh, throughout my presentation today. I just wanna make some caveats about my uh, talk today. So I am talking about the history of scientific racism. And so I am gonna use some archaic terminology that is no longer used and is uh, uh, repellent for many of us. And I just wanna point out right from the beginning that the history of racism in science is truly abhorrent and horrible, but I'm not gonna end every slide by saying, and this is absolutely terrible. I just uh, will state that from the, from the outset and I'm hoping to convey to you uh, some of the relevant information. My lecture is really focused on uh, European and North American uh, scientists, and I've relied primarily on primary and secondary sources. And as a result, the historical record and what has been written subsequently about uh, uh, scientific racism uh, is really limited in on information on scientists who opposed scientific racism. And so I have very few examples to offer uh, you with regards to that. Um, the other key point, of course, is that as, as we've heard in the introduction that uh, uh, science uh, is very much intertwined with the social milieu and the history of scientific racism certainly is as well. I'll point out some uh, cases in which we can see a clear example, but I'm not going to do that extensively. And I think that's something that you can do. You can think about the context in which uh, these, this research and these ideas were being, uh, being promoted. So to start off, there's two key uh, components that we need to think about when we think about the introduction of race as a scientific uh, concept in amongst European scientists. And the first is the great chain of being. This was the uh, European conceptualization of uh, the living world that had a hierarchy that sort of placed uh, living beings and indicated who had authority over, uh, over who. And so this uh, uh, hierarchical structure placed, for example, plants down the bottom and God at the top, just below God were the angels and then the humans and then animals and other forms of life. And so there was very much a hierarchical thinking about how life was ordered. In addition, uh, this is occurring, the introduction of uh, race as a scientific idea is occurring in the context of European exploration, where Europeans were going out and sailing across the oceans and interacting with people from different parts of the world that they had never interacted with uh, previously. So it was in this context that Carl Linnaeus in 1735 published Systema Naturae. This was a, uh, uh, a very important text in which uh, Linnaeus introduced the nomenclature that we still use today that uh, classifies organisms in terms of classes and species, for example. Now Linnaeus published many editions over the course of his life. And in the first nine editions, uh, he classified humans into four distinct varieties. Those varieties you can see on your screen there. This is the Americanus, the Europaeus, Asiaticus, and the Africanus. And these uh, varieties were classified on the basis of physical characteristics such as uh, skin color. Linnaeus was the, uh, one of the first to uh, advance the idea that human beings are animals and he named our species Homo sapiens as the animals that know thyself. And in correspondence, it's clear that Linnaeus uh, concluded that uh, Homo sapiens comprised a single uh, species. He stated that if the slightest trait or difference was sufficient, there would easily stick out thousands of different species of man and who with the same mind would be so frivolous as to call these distinct species. By the 10th edition, Linnaeus's categories became hierarchical and incorporated social and cultural factors and bias as you can see uh, here. And so in this case, the varieties are in a hierarchy with Americanists actually at the top and Africanus at the bottom. And Linnaeus 
uh, not only used physical characteristics to classify these different uh, varieties of Homo sapiens, but used, for example, uh, behavioral traits, classifying Europaeus as being characterized as having light, wise, and inventor-like behavior, whereas Asiaticus was stern, haughty, and greedy. We can see in, uh, when we look at the uh, uh, um, features that Linnaeus used in his categorization, that many of these uh, claims or these features are uh, reflect stereotypes of the day. And what is uh, important and consistent throughout all of Linnaeus's categorizations in his hierarchy is that Africanus was always at the bottom largely described by negative uh, um, factors, as you can see here. <clears throat> In addition to these four uh, varieties of humans, Linnaeus also included two additional varieties of humans, Homo monstrous and Homo ferus, and some examples uh, shown here of the individuals that belong to these uh, additional two varieties of humans. And I put this here just for historical context so you can see some of Linnaeus's uh, thinking and question whether it was necessarily uh, resulting from empirical research. It was in his English translation in 1792 that uh, Linnaeus introduced this tri trinomial nomenclature of genus, species, and subspecies, and in doing so he really entrenched the idea that there are different, uh, this concept that there are different subspecies of humans. And this is a, is a replication of uh, Linnaeus's English translation here, where you can see the different uh, varieties that he uh, has included and this subspecies uh, nomenclature that has persisted, persisted for many, many years. Following Linnaeus's work, Johann Blumenbach, who was considered the founder of comparative zoology and anthropology, uh, addressed the question of the different types of human races. He uh, was in, used, for example, skull measurements and different morphologies in order to define a typology of human races. And he defined five types of uh, humans, the Caucasian or white race, the Mongolian or yellow race, the Malayan or brown race, the Ethiopian or black race, and the American or red race. Blumenbach's classification was hierarchical and he advanced the degenerative hypothesis, which is articulated here. He stated that I have allotted the first place to the Caucasians as I esteem it to be the primeval one that is descended from Adam and Eve. And then this diverges in both directions into the Ethiopian and the Mongolian and the remaining intermediate positions between the primeval one and those uh, two extremes. And so he, his classification was inherently uh, hierarchical. It's interesting to note that it was Blumenbach who introduced the term Caucasian. He used this term because for the Caucasian variety, he said, I have taken the name of this variety from Mount Caucasus because it produces the most beautiful race of men. I mean, the Georgians, the greatest probability to place the uh, origins of mankind in this area uh, here is shown on the map. And he stated that this stock displays the most beautiful form of the skull that is white in color, the primitive color of mankind for it is easy for that to degenerate into brown but much more difficult for brown to become white when the secretion and precipitation of this carbonaceous pigment has once deeply struck root. And it's interesting for us to reflect on the fact that this term Caucasian is still uh, used very uh, frequently in common discourse. And I, I question whether people know it's the origins of, uh, of this terminology. Darwin's publication uh, in the middle of the 1800s on the origins of the species by means of natural selection and preservation of favored races in the struggle for life had little to offer on with regards to uh, human beings. Darwin stuck to uh, animals in his, uh, in his seminal work, but he subsequently published additional works, including The Descent of Man and Selection uh, in Relation to Sex, but he really had little to say about uh, the different categories of, uh, of humans. 
he did weigh in on the argument uh, stating that the most weighty of all the arguments against treating the races of man as distinct species is that they can graduate into each other independently in many cases, as far as we can judge, of their having uh, intercrossed. He did, however, state that at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races uh, throughout the world. But it was actually his cousin, Francis Galton, who uh, took those Darwinian ideas and uh, advances in understanding of human heredity to introduce the concept of eugenics. So Galton, as pictured here, um, was the, uh, a polymath who uh, was involved in many different areas of research to do with human heredity and statistics. If you use linear regression, Galton was the uh, uh, originator of that method. And Galton introduced this concept of eugenics, which stated that what nature does blindly, slowly, and ruthlessly, man may do providently, quickly, and kindly as it lies within his power, so it becomes his duty to work in that direction. And this uh, eugenics idea uh, became uh, extremely popular amongst the uh, scientific uh, thinkers of the day, those who are involved in uh, I thinking, discovering uh, human heredity and its underlying basis. And the idea was that, uh, as, as shown in this uh, eugenic society poster from the 1930s, is that uh, we needed to harness our new knowledge of human heredity and uh, Darwinian fitness in order to direct uh, humankind to release the uh, burden of heredity, disease, and, uh, and unfitness. Golden was particularly uh, interested in the inheritance of uh, intelligence and published the book Hereditary Genius in which he, uh, one of the chapters is entitled The Comparative Worth of Different Races. And Darwin stated that I shall make frequent use of the law of deviation from an average. He was a quantitative thinker. I shall assume the intervals between the grades of ability are the same in all races a result which again points to the conclusion that the average intellectual standard of the Negro is some two grades below our own. As a uh, Brit British uh, scientist at the turn of the century, he of course assigned the ablest race of whom history bears record is unquestionably the ancient Greeks. But here in this uh, excerpt from this chapter, we can see the uh, clear uh, racist uh, thinking uh, of you know, leading uh, scientific thinkers of the day. The concept of eugenics gained a foothold uh, in the UK, but it became particularly popular when it uh, went across the Atlantic and developed in US academic uh, institutions during the earliest 20, 20th century. One of the uh, earliest advocates and uh, promoters of eugenics was Charles Davenport, who was a uh, poultry chicken geneticist. Uh, but he uh, saw or you know, uh, sought to use the power of our newfound understanding of human uh, inheritance and uh, evolution to direct uh, the evolution of human society. Whereas in the UK, uh, the eugenics movement is considered uh, positive eugenics, positive in this case, uh, because this entailed the promotion of marriages and matings that would result in children with desirable traits. In the US, this was taken to the extreme and the uh, so-called negative eugenics called for preventing the reproduction of the genetically unfit, possibly by state enforced sterilization. In this case, the argument was that if the state had the right to take away life, why shouldn't the state have the right to prevent uh, undesirable births? And Davenport was uh, really at the forefront of this thinking and advocacy. This was, uh, he, he was funded by uh, philanthropists and tycoons and established the Carnegie Station for Experimental Evolution at uh, Cold Spring Harbor and then the Eugenics Record Office. Uh, which is where the present day Cold Spring Harbor laboratories sit. You might uh, recognize this shot here. This is uh, um, from uh, that period, but this is exactly the same shot that we often see of Cold Spring Harbor uh, laboratories. 
eugenic scientists like Charles Davenport advanced racist ideas under the guise of eugenics uh, thinking. Davenport studied the effects of race intermingling uh, famously in Jamaica and published uh, the article making the following claim that one often sees in mulattoes an ambition and push combined with intellectual inadequacy, which makes the unhappy hybrid dissatisfied with his lot and a nuisance to others. Miscegenation, which is the marriage between people of different races, commonly spells disharmony. And he stated that a hybridized people are a badly put together people and a dissatisfied, restless, and ineffective people. Davenport's ideas were not some fringe idea. Eugenics was taught as cutting edge science in academic institutions throughout the United States. Here are two textbooks, Genetics and Eugenics by Castle and Applied Genetics by Paul Popineau and Roswell Johnson. And these were the textbooks that were used in eugenics classes uh, throughout all uh, US academic institutions. In these textbooks were, for example, uh, uh, chapters such as the one I'm showing here, the color line in which uh, Popineau uh, cites the work of Ferguson on the relative intelligence of Negroes and whites in which uh, Ferguson quantifies the uh, racial purity of uh, people with respect to their uh, intelligence and concludes that the Negro is out of his environment in the United States. He is much less fit in the Darwinian sense and is eugenically inferior. Society, white society, long ago reached the uh, instinctive conclusion that it must put a ban on intermarriage between the two races. And so here we see how uh, textbooks and current scientific thinking was used to uh, advance and justify uh, racist policies. The eugenics movement in the US uh, gained uh, incredible popularity. Here is a, a certificate that was awarded to emeritus exhibit at the uh, International Congress of Eugenics in 1921 at the American Museum of Natural uh, History in New York. And we can see here that eugenics is promoted as a interdisciplinary uh, effort that combines genetics, anthropology, statistics, sociology, psychology in order to better uh, human uh, stock. It permeated out into uh, uh, all aspects of society. Here is a photograph of the Fit of Families contestants at the 1924 Georgia State Fair in Savannah. And state fairs were used as venues for educating people about eugenics and judging human stock to select the most eugenically fit in, uh, in contests. And eugenics as advocated by science and scientists was used as the justification for policies that restricted immigration in the US for anti-miscegenation laws that prevented marriages between people of different races. And then for the compulsory sterilization of people's of African-American, Latina, and Native American descent. And actually in many states as shown here, uh, there were executive uh, agencies that carried out sterilizations in the name of uh, eugenics. <clears throat> American eugenics uh, crossed back to across the Atlantic and was incorporated uh, into Nazi uh, thinking and in the, con in the uh, concept of racial hygiene. So on your screen here, you're looking at a uh, uh, excerpt from a high school textbook in which the burden on society is depicted by people uh, of different uh, abilities or different races. And the concept of race and hygiene uh, entailed uh, the scientists who provided the scientific backing uh, for many of the uh, Nazi policies. And these scientists were university professors from the Kaiser Wilhelm Society, which is the predecessor of the Max Planck uh, Society. And these ideas were very much inspired by the thinking and the adoption of the eugenic uh, policies in the United States. And here are a couple of books that uh, 
discuss this very, uh, very close connection. It's clear that in uh, Nazi Germany that scientists and science provided the justification for the uh, Nazi atrocities as manifest in the Nuremberg race laws that defined people's uh, race on the basis of uh, their heredity and then culminated in the, uh, in the uh, Holocaust and the loss of millions of lives. It was in this context that uh, following the Second World War, the voices of scholars who had been uh, fighting against some of this uh, racist ideology that was in the scientific mainstream thinking of the time, such as the uh, uh, anthropologist Franz Boas and Ashley Montague, spearheaded the 1950 UNESCO statement on race. In this preamble, they state that the importance which the problem of race has acquired in the modern world scarcely needs to be pointed out. Mankind will not soon forget the injustices and crimes which give such tragic overtones to the word uh, race. And this was a statement that was uh, drafted uh, under the aegis of UNESCO by leading scientists from different parts of the world, including, for example, uh, Claude Levi-Strauss, a famous uh, anthropologist and uh, uh, Dubjansky, a famous uh, geneticist, along with Kurt Stern. In this statement, the committee asserted human equality based on four uh, premises, that the mental capacities of all races are similar, that no evidence exists for biological deterioration as a result of hybridization. There is no correlation between national or religious groups and any particular race and that race was less a biological fact than a social myth and that biology proved the universal brotherhood of man. <clears throat> An important subsequent study in 1972 entitled The Apportionment of Human Diversity by the uh, geneticist Richard Lewontin took human polymorphisms that could be measured at the time, which were from uh, protein polymorphisms as detected in blood and took peoples from different uh, populations that belonged to the so-called races, as you can see on your screen here, including the Caucasians, Black Africans, Mongoloids, uh, et cetera. And what Lewontin did in this study is he studied the uh, frequency distribution of these alleles in these uh, different populations and applying a method that is essentially uh, like an ANOVA method in which the variance is partitioned within populations and between populations, Lewontin found that the mean proportion of the total species diversity that is contained within populations is 85.4%, and that only 6.3% is accounted for by racial classification. He concluded in this paper that it is clear that our perception of relatively large differences between human races and subgroups as compared to the variation within these groups is indeed a biased perception and that based on randomly chosen genetic differences, human races and populations are remarkably similar to each other with the largest part by far of human variation being accounted for by the differences between individuals. He went on to say that human racial classification is of no social value and is positively destructive of human and social relations. And since such racial classification is now seen to be of virtually no genetic or taxonomic significance either, no justification can be offered for its continuance. And indeed, this, uh, this metric of 85% of the diversity uh, occurring within populations is one that uh, you frequently hear quoted uh, to this date. A subsequent uh, important study around the turn of the century uh, looked at the genetic structure of human uh, populations, Rosenberg et al. And in this study, they had access to many more genetic markers. They looked at uh, 377 uh, genetic markers in a thousand or so individuals from different populations. And using uh, uh, these data, concluded that within population differences among individuals account for 93 to 95% of genetic variation. And the differences amongst major groups constitute only three to 5% of genetic variation. They did however, go on to say that never, nevertheless, without using prior information about the origins of individuals, we identified six main genetic clusters. And these are the clusters shown down the bottom here using the uh, clustering method developed by Jonathan Pritchard and five of which correspond to the major G 
geographic uh, regions. Around the time of this study and subsequently, there have been a number of major population genetic studies that have sought to characterize genetic diversity within and between populations. In the 1990s, there was a, a, an effort to undertake the Human Genome Diversity uh, Project. And then in the 2000s, there was the Haplotype Map Project or the HapMap Project. And in the 2010s, there was the Thousand Genomes Project. And these different projects have been, uh, uh, the motivation for them has often been technological advancements that allow increased resolution uh, of genetic variation between and within populations. If you look at um, post uh, Second World War uh, terminology in these publications, it's clear that uh, scientific studies uh, published since that time have attempted to distance this uh, research from race science. So rather than using the term race, the terminologies that are often used are geographic populations, continent of origin, biodiversity, rather than hybrids, we, uh, these studies use uh, terminology like admixed populations and talk about ancestry or genetic ancestry. And where uh, race is used, it is typically uh, defined as self-reported uh, race. Racism persisted, has persisted and continues to persist in science since the uh, Second World War in many different cases. Here are some of the most notorious cases. The uh, psychologist J. Philip Rushton published the book Race, Evolution and Behavior in the uh, 80s, where in which he essentially uh, attempted to recapitulate the sort of studies that Golden had done around the beginning of the 1900s. And then the notorious bell curve was published in the uh, 1990s that made the argument that there were innate intelligence differences between people of different uh, racial groups. And then the, uh, one of the co-discoverers of the structure of DNA and the director of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories, uh, Jim Watson, is notorious for espousing racist and sexist uh, pontifications uh, uh, that have been tolerated by the scientific community for, for many, many years until very recently. And this, uh, these racist science and scientists have been particularly pernicious and, you know, because racism that emanates from the academy has, uh, has a great uh, weight. And so I think this is important for us to be aware of these examples and, uh, and, and vigilant in uh, in our thinking. Even when we have the best of intents and purposes, contemporary culture can still appropriate scientific findings uh, related to human genetic variation. So uh, an example that I'm showing you here is, uh, I'll, I'll uh, see if I can get this to run for you. So you can look at these, watch these young men. Uh, in this case, what these young men are doing is chugging uh, milk. And this is motivated by a scientific study that was published in Nature Genetics at the beginning of the uh, 2000s that identified a variant associated with adult type hyperlactasia. So this is the ability to uh, uh, metabolize lactose uh, through adulthood. And in this case, this uh, variant was identified in Northern Europeans, the Finns, and then other Northern Europeans. And this is uh, part of the underlying basis of the ability, uh, the difference between people who are lactose tolerant and lactose intolerant. And so you can see here these young men uh, demonstrating their uh, racial purity by their ability to uh, chug uh, milk. Unfortunately, uh, in this case, they, uh, they've missed, there's a missed opportunity here because this is a very interesting example of convergent uh, evolution as there are uh, African populations in which uh, independently mutations have uh, arisen that have uh, conferred this uh, identical trait. More recently, it's become very popular uh, to assess your genetic ancestry through uh, organizations like Ancestry.com or 23andMe. And I just want to take a moment to watch this uh, advertisement here. Greatness lives within all of us. And with Ancestry DNA on sale for just $69, now is the time to discover yours. You can find out where you get 
your precision, your grace, your drive. And now, with more than 150 ethnic regions to connect to, only Ancestry DNA can put your greatness on full display. Save 30% now at AncestryDNA.com. So I show you this because in this advertisement, this is a company that's using cutting edge uh, technology and population genetics to identify your ancestry. And yet they seem to be implying that uh, particular traits are associated with particular people, that your precision comes from your Scandinavian ancestry, your grace comes from your Asian ancestry, and your drive comes from your uh, British ancestry. It is clear that uh, race impacts human health and disparities uh, that are, we are experiencing today with the COVID pandemic. So uh, here is data from the uh, COVID tracking project that uh, confirms that uh, black people have died at a 1.4 times the rate of white people during uh, the current pandemic. This can be uh, explained, or this is consistent with the idea that uh, race is a social construct and really that the risk factor for increased uh, uh, morbidity here is uh, racism. However, I wanted to ask the question, what is the impact of ignoring uh, genetic differences uh, between humans? And I think there's a, an important example that we're in the midst of right now. So the cutting edge approach in population genetics at the moment is to do case control studies in which individuals who have a particular condition like cardiovascular disease, for example, are genotyped throughout the genome and individuals who are in a control group are genotyped. And then a statistical test is performed to identify variants that increase one's risk for uh, that particular disease. If we look at uh, recent history at the uh, proportion of people who have been involved in these genome-wide association uh, studies, we can see that there's a huge over-representation of people of uh, European uh, ancestry relative to their uh, uh, representation in the global population as shown on the, the right here. And that many of the uh, minority racial groups are underrepresented uh, in this uh, in this uh, undertaking that is the basis of personalized medicine. The idea here is that population studies can be performed to identify variants that increase one's risk for a particular disease, and then that information can be used to predict for individuals what their risk is of uh, uh, acquiring a particular uh, disease. And because of this bias sampling in these GWAS studies, this promise of personalized medicine is negatively impacted. So if we look here at the prediction accuracy of known genetic risk factors relative to its prediction accuracy in uh, Europeans, we can see that people of different, uh, different populations, though the uh, genetic, the utility of that information is greatly, uh, greatly reduced. And so there's a clear negative uh, impact of this bias sampling in these genetic studies. And so I'll conclude there by uh, just reiterating uh, what I've conveyed to you today that despite our modern conception of race as a social construct, that race very much originated as a scientific concept, that science was used as justification for racist policies for several hundred years, and that scientists played a key role in advocating and advancing these racist policies, but that following the atrocities of World War II, scientists rejected the biological concept of race and race is now considered to be a social construct by scientists. Nonetheless, the classification of humans based on a conflation of ancestry, physical characters, genetics, and social factors remains very much an unsolved uh, issue in science and medicine. And just with this history in mind and just uh, in uh, uh, relevant salient to our discussion that I'd like to have today is a paper that was just published last week in, uh, in Science by Shirley Tillman and Bruce Alberts and Harold Varmus amongst others in which they lay out for us in stark 
reality, the disproportionate representation of different racial groups within the academy. So in red here, looking at percentages, are the national pr proportion of white individuals, black individuals, Hispanic individuals, and indigenous individuals. And you can clearly see the uh, low diversity that is evident at all levels of, uh, in the academy. And I think this is, these are important data for us to uh, reflect on when we uh, think about and look at our, the history of our fields. And so I'd like to conclude there by acknowledging uh, some groups. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge the graduate biology group uh, here at NYU and the biology department anti-racist reading group who gave me some really excellent feedback on my uh, talk today. And I would like to recognize the uh, efforts of the NYU biology staff, postdocs and students who in response to the Black Lives Matter movement during the summer of 2020, coalesced and wrote a document in which they outlined many great ideas of how we can begin to address inequities in our department and university. And their uh, efforts were really compelled me to uh, join them in this journey through this way. And I would like to thank uh, Wei Ji for spearheading this, uh, this effort and allowing me to be part of it. And I'll post now Again, the questions that I presented at the beginning of my talk, and uh, thank you all for your attention.